Okay, so I want you to go back to the year 2001. There's a little console known as the GameCube on the market. Now, despite being a commercial disappointment for Nintendo selling roughly 21 million units, the GameCube was a very well-respected console with some truly innovative titles in its library. Chief among them was a title that would unknowingly conceive one of the largest competitive scenes in video game history, and would end up being the highest selling game on the console. That game is Super Smash Bros. Melee. Now, Melee had an infamously rushed development cycle, being made in a mere 13 months, which, if you know anything about video game development, is a minuscule amount of time. Despite this, the game would release to critical acclaim and go on to sell 7 million copies, and would subsequently kickstart the Smash Brothers competitive scene. Now, many of the new characters in Melee were usually just clones of other already existing characters, often with very minute differences. You have Roy, the slower yet stronger Marth clone with flame properties added to his attacks. You have Ganondorf, who bizarrely was a clone of Captain Falcon for some reason, but just a bit more on the sluggish side. And then there's Dr. Mario, who is quite literally just Mario, but with a medical license and a six-figure salary. One of these new clone characters was Pichu, a smaller, weaker, and lighter version of Pikachu. It already doesn't sound good for the little guy, but there are some benefits. His smaller size gives him a smaller hitbox, meaning that less attacks are actually going to connect with him. And he has some decent moves. But there's one glaring issue that highlights why Pichu is viewed by many as one of, if not the worst character in the entire game. A grand majority of his attacks actually cause Pichu to inflict self-damage, meaning that in a normal round, even if Pichu is unscathed by the opponent, he's still going to be taking quite a bit of accumulating damage. Couple that with the fact that he has the lowest weight in the game, and Pichu gets three stocked faster than you can blink. So why would you want to pick Pichu when Pikachu is the infinitely superior option? In other words, this is you, and this is the guy that your girlfriend warned you about. And for years, Pichu remained that way, a joke character with little to no competitive viability. But then Super Smash Bros. Ultimate was released. See, Smash Ultimate's main selling point was that it featured every single fighter from previous iterations, meaning that Pichu was going to be making his triumphant return as a bottom tier joke character and nothing more. Right? Well, he keeps all of the properties he had from Melee, including the self-inflicting damage, so you would think that he wouldn't really climb up the roster too much. However, in the early days of Smash Ultimate, Pichu was considered one of the best characters in the game, and broke not only the will of tournament players, but also the controllers of his opponents. Um. Spiked his controller so hard! His tiny hurtbox and quick, heavy hitting kill moves caused Pichu to be a nuisance in the competitive scene, even being deemed better than Pikachu for a while. Of course, he eventually got nerfed at a balance patch and descended to roughly B tier status. But you still see him at tournaments every now and then. This is what I'm gonna be talking about today characters that, at face value, seem fairly unimpressive, but upon further observation are ungodly overpowered, to the point where it makes you wonder how the developers didn't notice their strengths the first time around. Enjoy! Red Riding Hood and Prince Charming versus Pussy Boots versus Pinocchio. When it comes to video games, Shrek has had a fairly mixed batting average in terms of overall quality. Despite this, however, whenever a quality video game based on the Shrek universe is released, it usually ends up exceeding expectations by at least a fairly moderate margin. Just about every notable Shrek connoisseur will tell you that Shrek Super Slam is among the Flatulent Ogre's best games. Funnily enough, it's actually an extremely prominent part of my childhood, as it was one of the first games I ever played that introduced me to the fighting game genre. It's an ungodly high bar, I know. For a lengthy period of time, while Shrek Super Slam was viewed as a surprisingly solid fighting game, it wasn't exactly making shockwaves in the fighting game community. However, this would all change in 2015, when a small group of players would ironically host tournaments for this game, only to fortuitously create a surprisingly avid and lively competitive scene. What's hilarious about this is that Shrek Super Slam actually has a surprising amount of competitive mechanics weaved into its gameplay, everything from air dashing to perfect shielding to even character-specific mechanics. It's like the developers were able to envision the game's future as a competitive fighter. Now when you think of a Shrek fighting game, who do you think would be deemed as the top of the pack? In the very primitive days of the game's competitive scene, Donkey was outright banned because he was seen as overpowered. I'll uh, take preconceptions that aged horribly for 500. Or maybe it's Genome, one of the handful of original characters made exclusively for the game. I mean, based on description alone, he fits the archetype for what a top tier character would have. He's small, has quick attacks, and has a war cry that would leave even the most hardened fighting game enthusiast in a state of fear-induced paralysis. <laughs> 
While he is considered a relatively high tier character, he's still not placed among the coveted S tiers, usually being seen at around the A tier range. Or maybe it's the titular ogre himself, Shrek. Maybe he'd get blessed with a case of main character bias. But no, it's actually quite the opposite. He's actually seen by many Shrek Super Slam aficionados as one of, if not the worst character in the entire game. So who is it? Who takes the crown as the most cataclysmically overpowered character in the game? Well, I'll give you a hint. She's packing more than food in that basket. She's got some bullshit in there too. Yeah, Little Red Riding Hood. At first glance, she's nothing to worry about, but put her in a competitive environment and she's an absolute monster on the battlefield. Her hurt box is extremely small, more so than a grand majority of the roster, making it tough to even land a hit on her. Her Super Slam, a special move that you can perform after filling up a meter, is a behemoth of an attack. As she kneels down and evokes the power of airbending, as she conjures up a whirlwind with the destructive force of a Category 5 hurricane. Why does she do this? This is the same game that lets you play as a sentient egg and a unicorn named after a bacterial infection. Anthrax! You shouldn't be asking rational questions like this. But then, we get to the apples. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, sure, but these apples send you straight to the golden gates, no questions asked. These apples are the bread and butter of her moveset, allowing her to chain combos like she's starting a food fight. There are three different attacks that can utilize apples, and all of them have at least one good use case. That doesn't sound like much, but in Shrek Super Slam, having three attacks that can actually function in the heat of battle is a significant advantage. And of course, because Red Riding Hood just somehow wasn't powerful enough, she has a zero to death infinite that, from what I've read, works on a grand majority of the roster. In fact, as of this video, she's the only character in the game to be outright banned from tournaments. To put that into perspective, Meta Knight in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, despite his immense power in the game's roster, was not banned on a widespread scale. Let that sink in. A deceptively innocent fairy tale character who wields the power of vitamin C was banned at the competitive level, but Meta Knight wasn't. Only in the world of video games is that possible. Okay, how could I not talk about an unintentionally broken characters list without mentioning Odd Job? GoldenEye 007, or as it's more prominently known, GoldenEye 64, set a new benchmark for licensed games when it was released all the way back in 1998. It firmly established that, if given enough time and care towards the source material, licensed games could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the heavy hitters of the video game industry. One of the most fondly remembered aspects of GoldenEye 64 is its multiplayer mode, which, funnily enough, was made in secrecy in a mere six weeks before the game's launch. Of course, this ended up making GoldenEye 64 the go-to multiplayer game of late 90s households, which says quite a lot considering that this is the same console that gave us Mario Party, Mario Kart, and even the first Super Smash Bros. Just to stir the pot a little bit, I'll tell you right now that only one of these is a party game, and I already gave you half of the answer in this very sentence. Sue me. Of course, when you develop an entire mode in such a brief period of time, some cracks are eventually going to become a bit visible. Case in point, the character known as Odd Job. In the multiplayer mode, you can pick from a variety of characters, some of which weren't even seen in GoldenEye, but in other James Bond movies. The character that really sticks out is Odd Job, who has the distinction of being the shortest character in the game, despite the fact that his movie appearance shows that he's of average height. Perhaps it was made to highlight the dichotomy between him and Jaws, the tallest character in the game. Regardless, it's his height, or lack thereof that gains him an extreme advantage over the competition. You see, GoldenEye 64 has a subtle lock-on mechanic that generally aims at the chest-to-head level of a character whenever you pull the trigger. However, what the developers didn't realize was that a grand majority of the characters had similar, if not the exact same height. So whenever you shoot at Oddjob, you instead fire bullets at an area just above his head, meaning that you cannot kill him by simply shooting him. You have to stop what you're doing, hold down the aim button, and try not to panic as this little mustached gremlin with a bowler hat charges towards you and wipes away your health in a few clean shots. In other words, he was one of the earlier examples of what many in the modern age classify as a crutch character. Any player who picked him was almost immediately deemed a cheater and was subsequently uninvited from the following gatherings. Unless it was your little brother. You kinda stuck with him. Oddjob's advantage in combat became so disgust and widespread that the spiritual successor to the game, Perfect Dark, had a similarly height-starved character known as Elvis the Alien, who was luckily not as powerful due to his large head allowing for easy headshots. Oddjob, despite all of his strengths, has one crippling weakness, and that's reaching the highest shelf at the grocery store. I mean, it's it, it's not like I'm any better. I'm I'm only five foot four. It's just allergies, okay? What do you think about our relationship? Right as rain, sir. While the Commonwealth leaves something to be desired, 
It's all well and good as long as we're together. When journeying through a post-apocalyptic wasteland, it is a generally good idea to make some friends along the way who can assist you. When it comes to the Fallout universe, these aforementioned friends come in all shapes and sizes, ranging from an intelligent and well-spoken super mutant named Fox, to Cass, a former caravan merchant turned vulgar gunslinger with a penchant for booze and violence, to Nick Valentine, a slick, hard-boiled synth detective with a strong moral compass and a thirst for justice. Fallout 4 in particular has my favorite suite of companions, with pretty much all of them bringing at least something advantageous to the table. One of the best companions in the game is also the first one that you meet, that of course being Codsworth, the suave, charming, and gentlemanly Mr. Handy Robot. You can find him at the earliest point in the game, the now iconic opening section in which you and your family must escape your neighborhood and hightail it to the nearest vault after a series of destructive nuclear bombings are reported on the news. After escaping from the vault, you can find Codsworth roaming around the remains of what was once the player's home. How Codsworth survived a nuclear disaster is unknown, but I can only assume that he's got some durable armor. Meanwhile, I stub my toe in the bathroom wall and I mistakenly believe it's broken. Clearly, Codsworth has some goddamn resilience. At first glance, you just wouldn't expect Codsworth of all characters to be such a dominant force on the battlefield. He's constantly upholding a fairly chipper attitude, which usually doesn't equate to ruthless killing machine. May I accompany you, sir? Please do. Splendid! And in terms of his arsenal of weaponry, he's stuck with nothing more than a flamethrower and a buzzsaw. And I know exactly what you're thinking. That sounds awesome, what are you talking about? And generally, I'd agree with you if it wasn't for the fact that flamethrowers in Fallout 4 are, for the most part, absolutely abysmal. And you'd probably be better off throwing a baseball at your enemies instead. Okay, bad example, but you get what I mean. However, when you look at his stats, Codsworth is no slouch. His melee attacks are surprisingly effective, tearing through enemies like they're made of paper, all while keeping his jovial and courteous demeanor. He has the third highest strength of all the companions in the game, only being bested by X688. So that's where Elon got it from. And the aptly named Strong, who lacks the brains, but most certainly has the brawn. What's on your mind? Don't eat bugs. Taste awful. I would say thank god he's pretty, but, you know. He's seen better days. And remember earlier when I mentioned his resilience? Well, he's not just immune to nuclear explosions, as he can soak in quite a bit of damage from enemies, making him a force to be reckoned with. And as the cherry on top, he'll randomly bestow you with purified water for your travels. In a normal circumstance, this would be an odd display of affection and admiration towards someone, but this is the world of Fallout, purified water is practically liquid gold. When Fallout 4 released, many saw Codsworth as a strong companion to have alongside you in the early hours of the game, but at the halfway point would begin to falter a little bit. Still a good companion to have with you, but nowhere near as strong as the earlier portions of the game. However, when the Automatron DLC released, Codsworth became a different beast entirely. See, the Automatron DLC gives you the robot workbench, which grants you the ability to craft your very own robot or add modifications to already existing ones. You can already see where this is going. Codsworth goes from good to great, as you can suit him up with whatever robotic upgrades you can get your grubby little hands on, turning him from a convivial yet dangerous fighter to a war machine with a prim and proper British accent. And in terms of how you want to customize customize Codsworth, well, it's really up to you. You can go for a more low-key approach and give Codsworth some new weapons and maybe an armor upgrade, or you can go all in and completely overhaul him to the point where you now have a giant tank who demolishes raiders with pinpoint accuracy and tells jokes about algebra just five minutes later. Relationships are a lot like algebra. You always look at your ex and try to figure out why. And of course, no matter how many modifications you equip him with, his upbeat and optimistic demeanor is still kept intact. Because just like war, Codsworth never changes. Keep doing what you do, Codsworth. Okay, donut dunkers. You gonna bring Ivy to me, or am I gonna have to get her myself? The Batman Arkham series primarily fixates on two core gameplay styles that fit in perfectly with Batman's whole shtick, hand-to-hand -hand combat and stealth. You see, Batman is just as deadly when he's hiding among the shadows and picking off enemies one by one, as he is when he's taking on hordes of enemies in a 10 versus 1 brawl. And the Arkham games perfectly encapsulate that aspect of the Dark Knight. In other words, Batman is calculated but can also adapt on the fly. He truly does have the best of both worlds. You wanna know who that doesn't apply to? Harley Quinn. If there was ever a character who was a perfect antithesis to Batman, well, it would be the Joker. But we're not talking about him today, are we? But if I had to pick a runner-up, I think Harley Quinn would fit that bill damn near perfectly. She's loud, obnoxious, and has the subtlety of the Kool-Aid man, and that's not even mentioning the innuendos she's throwing out every two minutes like a deranged Duke Nukem. Why do guys always finish fast? Well, you didn't have to get personal about it. Fast forward to Arkham Knight, and you have eight different characters to play as in the game's challenge modes, as well as the numerous DLC campaigns that would be released over time. Harley Quinn would get a DLC campaign fittingly named the Harley Quinn Story Pack 
which saw Harley breaking into the Bloodhaven Police Department in order to break Poison Ivy out of her confines. Now, in the first few moments of controlling Harley Quinn, she seems like Arkham Knight's equivalent to a joke character in a fighting game. She's the only character in the game who cannot do silent takedowns because, and I quote, Why it ain't in my vocabulary? Yeah, well, Harley, irritation isn't in my vocabulary, but you're starting to make me reconsider. On top of that, she can't grapple up to vantage points like Batman, or jump with feline precision like Catwoman, as she just kind of hops up to whatever ledge is nearest to her, making stealth a bit more clunky and arduous than normal. And when it comes to gadgets, she's stuck with nothing more than a jack-in-the-box, some laughing gas, and a snare trap laced with confetti. You know what, Harley? That's not a half-bad idea. Maybe you could give these guys a gift as some sort of compromise. I mean, Christmas is around the corner. I'm gonna guess they prefer Hanukkah. However, put her in action and Harley is an absolute unit. Sure, she's not stealthy, not even in the slightest, but that jack-in-the-box that I mentioned earlier is easily one of the best gadgets in the game, as it's a remote explosive that attracts enemies to its sound and has a larger blast radius than normal. This would be just a standard run-of-the-mill tool in any other stealth game, but you have to understand that Harley is the only character that has something like this, immediately skyrocketing her use factor up to 11. But then put her in combat and, oh my god, Harley Quinn is packing some serious heat. At first, she seems fairly standard in hand-to-hand -hand combat, nothing too crazy. She can drop her jack-in-the-box and detonate it in the heat of battle, but it's a little inconsistent and it requires some setup. But you'll notice this hypnotic little meter on the top left of the screen. Surely this doesn't do too much collateral damage. Now you've done it! Oh, yeah, Harley Quinn has something called Mayhem Mode. You fill up the meter, press a button once it's filled up, and unleash the havoc, dispatching up to four enemies with an insta-kill move if you play your cards right. And if that wasn't broken enough, she can keep this meter filled outside of combat, meaning that if you're in a stealth section and you're even slightly outnumbered, well, hey, no worries, Mayhem Mode will do the rest. What's even more interesting is that if you pick Harley Quinn on the challenge maps, she actually doesn't have to deal with certain enemy types, which I assume is due to either her small amount of gadgets or simply because of how she was programmed. Regardless, not having to deal with large brutes, ninjas, or thugs coated in electricity is a really significant advantage. Plus, it prevents me from having stress-induced panic attacks in the midst of a combo. Because trust me, field medics, stun batons, and these infuriating shields, dear god, cause me enough anxiety as is. When it comes to fighting games, the Mortal Kombat series has an extremely deadly array of characters at its disposal. You have Raiden, a god of thunder that conjures lightning from his fingertips with a simple hand motion. You have Scorpion, an undead ninja who wields both the power of fire and a deadly kunai, with the latter coming equipped with an iconic catchphrase for good measure. Gah, never gets old. There's Liu Kang, who, let me remind you, can do stuff like this in the newest entry. Yeah, he's, um, he's not coming back from that, is he? And then there's Stryker, who is quite literally just a cop, and damn it, sometimes that's really all you need in order to be a competent fighter. Well, at least I would say that, except Mortal Kombat characters can block bullets and grenades, so his lethality is a bit up in the air. However, something that all of these characters have in common is that if you take away their abilities, all of these characters would be pretty competent in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Keep this in mind. Now, when 2011's Mortal Kombat rebooted the series and brought it back to its former glory, it became a tremendous critical and commercial success. Of course, when a fighting game becomes even remotely successful, you know that DLC characters are on the way, and there's about a 50% chance that they're gonna absolutely dominate the roster. <coughs> <laughs> well, the fourth and final DLC character from Mortal Kombat 9 was Freddy Krueger, a choice that absolutely no one was expecting, but everyone was ecstatic about. Sure, it wasn't the 1984 Robert England version of the character, but hey, Jackie Earl Haley was the best part of that painfully mediocre 2010 remake so I'd say it's a fair trade. However, Freddy Krueger isn't a character who fights his victims, opting more for mental torture and fear as a means of weakening his opponent, before going in for a fatal strike. In other words, Bruce Lee, this guy is not. However, all of that went right out the window when Freddy slam-dunked his way into the roster. He was a competitive nightmare, both figuratively and literally. 
as he's seen by many as one of the best zoners in the game and is often seen among the top 10 characters in the roster. A grand majority of his special attacks are projectiles, each of which can be sent in different trajectories, making it a tense guessing game of wondering what Freddy's gonna be throwing at you next. Then there's his down back four, the nightmare stance. Freddy gets into position and readies himself like he's about to erupt into a breakdancing session and can now choose between one of three different attacks, each of which hitting from different angles and positions, making his unpredictability factor even more imposing than before. And even when he's not zoning you out, he's hitting you with combos that can drain anywhere from 38 to a staggering 76% of your health bar meaning that once he has his hands on you, he's not letting go. Let me remind you that this is the same guy who got wrecked by Jason Voorhees and was absolutely annihilated in a rap battle against Wolverine. The second one isn't canonical, but, but still, I thought I'd bring it up. How he managed to survive both of these events and still have a fighting chance against the combatants of Mortal Kombat, I will never know. But you gotta respect the resilience. Somebody get this guy a blue medal and maybe some medicinal face cream. He's gonna need that second one. Traffic was awful. Tan Man really made a mess. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 is a genuinely fantastic sequel to the already impressive first entry released all the way back in 2018. Dear God, time flies. It is a huge improvement to the original game in every conceivable way, and is easily one of the best games this year. And let me remind you, this has been an absolutely monumental year for video games, so that should really tell you all you need to know. Whenever you play an Insomniac Spider-Man game, you generally know what you're getting into in a general sense. You'll be swinging among the buildings and skyscrapers of New York City like a super-powered trapeze artist, and taking on hordes of thugs and goons while spitting out one-liners just for the added humiliation. Despite the acclaim that the first game received, there was one aspect that many players criticized mainly the forced stealth sections with Mary Jane. Oh yeah, and there was a redhead there too. You're too late, Spider-Man! Weed has been legalized! The Mary Jane stealth sections in the first game admittedly did bring the game's pace down to a screeching halt. They came completely out of left field and contradicted the core gameplay loop that had already been established up to that point. I don't mind them personally, but still, it did feel quite out of place for a Spider-Man game. Regardless, Insomniac addressed this criticism by... bringing them back in the sequel. Why? If it didn't work the first time, it's not gonna work the second. Oh. Yeah, Insomniac wasn't even subtle about the improvements. This time around, Mary Jane was bestowed with a taser, which really doesn't sound like much at first glance, but trust me, that taser was a good financial investment. You can call redheads soulless all you want, but you gotta commend their fight or flight techniques. This taser completely breaks the game, as Mary Jane can not only stealthily approach enemies before shocking them into submission, but can also hail Mary herself into battle and take down enemies in a single shock. This has given her the nickname of Mary Jane Wick on the internet. And honestly, look at these moves and try to tell me that you disagree. <laughs> you just can't. Despite her immense power, there's one enemy type that she isn't capable of taking down, and that's the divorced chain smoker class. I'll get you, bitch. Eat your heart out, Shao Kahn. There's a new final boss in town, and he's here to take not only all the women, but also all the cigarettes. You have to understand that while Mary Jane can essentially one-hit kill her foes, Peter and Miles are stuck pounding on enemies for a prolonged period of time like it's the first day of December. And for those who don't know, I'll give you a hint. Gentlemen, your right hand is gonna be working overtime this month. But it's not just that either, because later on in the game, Mary Jane gets to use the stun gun as a makeshift pistol, granting her the ability to dispatch her foes at long distances. And honestly, I gotta admit, the stealth sections in this game are actually really well implemented and downright fun, making it feel like the closest thing to a crossover between Spider-Man and The Last of Us. Just, you know, minus the undead, the grisly violence, and the condescending plotline. All we need now is an Iron Man game that lets you play as Pepper Potts in some sections, but instead of a taser, she gets a sawed-off shotgun and a katana. Hey look, I never said it had to be a stealth section. What do you think, Mary Jane? Check it. I'm gonna take that as a maybe. Hey, you, watching the video. Thank you so much for tuning in. I wanted to take a second to uh, just thank everybody for all of the support on my previous video. As of right now, it is sitting at roughly 13,000 views. And uh, for me, that is a monumental achievement. Um, I know those aren't really big numbers in the grand scheme of things, like on bigger YouTube channels, but for me, I mean, that's huge. I never thought I would get even anywhere close to that. So thank you so much for all of the support, and I, I just appreciate it, thank you. 
and I'm gonna let you guys know that I'm gonna try to be uploading on a weekly basis, maybe at the most like every two weeks, but I'm still kind of shooting for that weekly basis. So just stay tuned, and once again, thank you so much for watching the video, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Have a great week, you guys. Thank you.